So the question is, why are there gaps there? Now, that might suggest that the, the time scale that we're given doesn't always work out because you have hundreds of millions of years which, for which there's essentially no evidence. It's, because we're told that the Devonian is a certain age, we're told that the Cambrian is a certain age, therefore there must be this period of time between the two. But if there's nothing there, where is your evidence for that? Now, to be fair, your evidence, you, you can find the, the Ordovician and Silurian rocks elsewhere, but you can't find them in the same sequence. So your time scale is actually uh, not so solid and certain as we're led to believe when you read your geology textbooks. And this um, great unconformity at the base of the Cambrian actually occurs all around the world, which means, means you start thinking, what's it, what's it mean? Why is it there? And it's in the Frenchman Mountain, the Grand Canyon, but also many other places. And it's a gap of about 1.2 billion years on a, a geological time scale. <clears throat> but there's ef evidence for massive erosion, because if there was any rock there, it's all disappeared. And if there, if there wasn't any rock there, it's very interesting, because you've got quite a flat uh, layer of rock, and then you've got other sedimentary rock deposited on top of it. So there's evidence of massive erosion. So is this uh, something that happened very quickly, actually, during the biblical flood? The start of a catastrophic worldwide flood will produce this kind of effect in the rocks. And that's rather suggestive that perhaps uh, there's a lot more to the, um, the geological story than we're sometimes led to believe, and it's it actually consistent with uh, having a worldwide flood. Although, again, there's a lot of uh, debate about that. There's lots of discussion that can be had. But, again, these pieces of evidence suggest that the uniformitarian slow, gradual deposition is not as solid and as certain as we're sometimes led to believe. So, lots of questions here, really, for, for us to think about. Let's move on to carbon-14. Carbon-14 is not much good, really, in, when it comes to dating the age of the Earth, because carbon-14 has a very short half-life as opposed to the other radiometric uh, methods which use uh, isotopes that have very long half-lives. Now, any piece of carbon, and um, you're made up of carbon, by the way, we're a carbon life form, and any, any piece of carbon of about a gram will contain 5 times 10 to the 12, which is about a billion, billion atoms of radioactive carbon-14. So we're all radioactive, by the way, because we've all got radioactive carbon-14 in us. Fortunately, the radioactivity isn't very uh, powerful, so it's not going to do you any harm, so you needn't worry. <clears throat> Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. So when you die, 5,730 years on, you'll have half the carbon-14 you have in you as you have now. Another 5,730 years, you'll have half again. And actually, at about um, 100,000 years from now, you'll have only about 0.0056% of modern carbon. In other words, that's the terminology they use to say modern carbon is today, but uh, if you go back uh, 100,000 years in the past or in the future, it's all relative, but you end up with, in 100,000 years, you end up with a very, very small percentage because the carbon-14 has decayed as it does. <clears throat> so if you have a sample of material that's got carbon in it, and it's, and it's supposed to be 300,000 years old, you'll have less than one atom of carbon-14 per gram of the carbon. So you take your diamond from your, your engagement ring, ladies, and you measure the, you can take the carbon in there, you can measure the carbon-14 in it. I wouldn't recommend it because you won't get your diamond back because they'll destroy it in the process. But you can measure You can actually try and analyse it for carbon-14. But of course, nobody's going to do that because we're told diamonds are actually millions of years old. But people have done it. And they start off with coal. Anthracite coal is carboniferous. Carboniferous means that it was laid down 290 to 360 million years ago. So there should be no carbon-14 left in that coal because, as you will know, coal is formed from plant material which is fossilised. So the plant material, when it was killed and buried and turned into coal, would have had carbon-14 in it. 100,000 years on, it would have very, very little carbon-14. 300,000 years further on, essentially zero carbon-14, one atom per gram, and now millions of years later, there should be absolutely no carbon-14. So it's pointless to take a piece of coal and give it to a lab saying, measure the carbon-14 for me, please. The trouble is, people did it. <clears throat> and they come up with some numbers. This is, again, in terms of percentage modern carbon. 0.42% um, by a team led by a gentleman called Grootz, published in 1986. And you can look this up in the literature. It's in the literature. And these numbers are, are recognised by everybody to be completely bizarre. They shouldn't happen. Because... Remember, we're talking about 200, 300 million year old coal. It should be no carbon-14 at all. So it should be zero, 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 zero. 
And, it's, and here we have another one by a group uh, led by uh, Bukins, 0.3, 0.4 again approximately, and uh, another group published in 1997, 0.2 to 0.35% modern karma. Now you might say that's not very much. Well, the way you check your method, any, me any analytical method, the way you check your analytical method is you try to measure zero. Right? You take a sample, you know, it has nothing in it, <clears throat> and that's your zero. You're always going to get a positive result because of the way of analytical methods work. Now, this method relies on taking a piece of carbon and basically turning it into a gas and firing it through a couple of mass spectrometers. And by firing it through mass spectrometers and applying a magnetic field, they can actually bend the atoms to go different places. And depending on the weight of the atom and the strength of the magnetic field and the speed it's going, you can direct specific atoms to a target and detect them. And that's what they do. So, in theory, this method can be absolutely foolproof and count, can count one atom of carbon-14. And it can actually filter out any, any interference. But in practice, of course, you can never do that. So if you do a machine blank, <coughs> you end up with numbers like 0.08 percentage modern carbon. And other, other experimenters have done checked it out different ways in their systems. And the numbers all come out pretty much the same. About the lowest you get is about 0.015 percentage modern carbon. Small numbers. So what you do if you want to see whether your result is real, you're going to have to de deduct that number, the blank, from your reading you get. Now, as you can see, we have here numbers about 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and here's your blank. So if you subtract the blank, you still come up with essentially a similar answer. So what we're detecting is carbon-14 in coal that is 300 million years old. How can that be? Well, one answer is the carbon-14 isn't 300 million years old. The, the coal is not 300 million years old. That, of course, is unacceptable to an evolutionist. But to somebody who believes the Bible, that's perfectly acceptable. And these numbers won't go away. There's lots of debate. You can read all about it on the internet. You can do web searches and come up with all discussion, the, the pros and cons and the various sources of possible error. But at the end of the day, these numbers do not go away. And they've done it with diamonds too. Diamonds are supposed to be millions of years old and they find measurable amounts of carbon-14 in diamond. And it's not contamination. They clean them up and they put, they put the diamond through the process and you get up with a positive answer, you come a positive answer in carbon-14. That's impossible. It cannot happen if the diamond is as old as we're told it is. <clears throat> okay, let's look uh, back to helium. Helium in zircon crystals. Now, uh, the American uh, geologists were looking around, in, I believe it was in Nevada, somewhere in North America, looking around for, for rock formations that might be useful for storing radioactive waste. So they were drilling great big holes in the rock down to about one and a half kilometers and taking out core samples and looking at the rock and see whether it was stable enough to make a good deposit for radioactive materials they were generating in their nuclear reactors. Still a problem today. But in their, in their uh, core samples, they came up with um, crystals called zircons, which is basically zirconium and silicon and a bit of oxygen. And it forms uh, nice uh, crystals. Here's a picture of one. Uh, they're quite small, most of them, but some of them are quite uh, large enough to see. And zircon is a very interesting sort of semi-precious stone, but it's very common in granite and other igneous rocks. And this is the kind of rock they were actually drilling through in the 19, 1982, I believe, they were drilling. And they got a lot of rock cores. <coughs> and uh, they were zircons are interesting because they're used in radiometric dating with a lead lead or uranium lead method because they contain actually lots of uh, uranium trapped inside them and uranium, ra the radioactive isotopes of uranium of course break down and they break down and produce lead. So zircon is often, very, is often used in radiometric dating. So what happens is one of the, one of the breakdown products from uranium-238 uh, which is a radioactive isotope is lead-206 uh, and there's various steps in the process but what happens is you've got eight steps where you get a helium atom given off. So inside your zircon crystal, crystal with, with uh, uranium impurities in it, you're going to have helium being produced. Eight atoms of helium for the whole process, which supposedly takes billions of years. So if you have a piece of zircon that is billions of years old, you're going to find helium in it. Well, actually, you're not going to find very much helium because helium, being a very light molecule, not attached to the crystal itself, is actually going to diffuse out and get lost. Now, these zircons were dug up, were drilled, came out of a drill sample, and they were given a radiometric age of one and a half billion years. And, uh, the, the results were published 
uh, and what what uh, the researchers discovered was that they, uh, they call it differential helium retention,